Thank you for being here today for our speaker series. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Valerie Ramey, who earned her PhD in economics from Stanford University. She's a professor of economics at UCSD and a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research. She's also a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a fellow of the Economic Econometric Society. She served on several National Science Foundation boards and advisory panels, and also on the Federal Economic Statistics Advisory Committee. She currently serves on the panel of economic advisors for the Congressional Budget Office, and is associate editor of the Quarterly Journal of Economics and Journal of Political Economy. Um, Professor Ramey has published numerous scholarly articles and policy relevant articles on the sources of business cycles, trends in wage inequality, effects of monetary and fiscal policy, the impact of volatility on growth, and various topics on time use, which is what we're here to hear about today, such as the increase in time investments in children by educated parents. And I first learned about Dr. Ramey's work reading in the New York Times um, about a paper that she had written, um, which is called The Rugrat Race. And um, I think this is a topic that should be interesting to all of us here at the school, and very salient, very relevant, and we're really glad that you're here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me to come here. It's always a delight to uh, talk at our uh, local high schools. I have to say, even though my children went to that other private high school in La Jolla. Um, <laughs> they didn't recover from that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about the role of the family in educational attainment. And basically, I'm going to talk about research from three papers but I'll, but I'll also that, that I have done, but also some other background research. So the theme of my presentation, um, I'm going to talk about how the family, including parents, children, and extended family inputs, are an important part of what economists like to call the educational production function. So we often look at the resources available at schools, you know, what, what the teacher-student ratio is, all those sorts of things are really important. But what I'm going to suggest is that what goes on in the household is at least as important. And, you know, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but uh, I'm going to give you some statistics to back that up. Now, but my presentation is going to focus specifically on time use because that's my area of uh, research, but I'm going to suggest to you that it's a really important input uh, that you see in the, coming out of the household. So I'm going to start by just overviewing achievement gaps by family socioeconomic status, which I'll shorten to SES. Then I'm going to talk about the rise in time spent with children by educated parents, and that's uh, reviewing uh, the paper, The Rug Rat Race, that my husband and I wrote. And then I'm going to talk about some other work I have in progress. One of them has been in progress for quite a while. It's just I keep getting asked to write macroeconomics papers, so uh, I never quite finished, I finished this one. Uh, test score gaps and time use. And it looks at ethnic racial differences in achievement, particularly in California, but then does a link with the time use, and it's some really intriguing results. And then finally, if I have time, I'm going to think about more the extended family and time spent with children by grandparents, and to what extent that they can make up for, you know, if the parents are busy working, to what extent are grandparents uh, making up by, by helping uh, children with their homework and things like that. Okay. So first of all, just as a little bit of background, you, as you probably know, achievement is strongly correlated with socioeconomic status, and it turns out more so in California than for the U.S. average. So here's a graph from uh, Sean Reardon, who's up at the uh, uh, Education um, Department, Education uh, Studies in at Stanford. Um, the horizontal axis over here are the lower income disadvantage districts. This one's by district, but you can also see it by students. But, um, and here is more affluent and more advantaged. And then on the vertical axis, we have the achievement level. Are they at grade level? Okay. And I should say, I'm going to let you have these slides too, so if you want the slides, I, I never mind uh, sharing them. Uh, the white circles are California districts, and the yellow circles are you know, what looks like tan, because there's so many, is the US. And several things to notice. One is that this line is positively sloped, it's like that, which means that in the more affluent advantage districts, 
the children are more likely to be above grade level. In the poor, disadvantaged districts, the children are more likely to have test scores below grade level. Okay? Now, that line is even steeper for California, so that the uh, achievement of California students who are poor or disadvantaged is below the U.S. They sort of cross here, but then California sort of takes off at the very upper rungs. Now, and it's not just, you know, people like to blame the schools. This happens as the kids enter kindergarten, all right? And again, California more so than the U.S. average. This is their achievement on entry for, you know, basic, you know, if they know letters, when they say reading, they're, they're obviously not expecting them to read Ulysses in kindergarten and math, but you're still seeing that sort of thing. So the kids from disadvantaged and poor households enter kin kindergarten with fewer skills than those who come from advantaged households. So some of California's difference with the U.S. is just simply how those kids are doing when they come into kindergarten. There's some makeup that you see, but you're still left with a, quite, quite a difference in achievement. So the other thing that's particularly uh, troubling in terms of thinking about you know, increase, you know, opportunities, and that is that the correlation between family, socioeconomic status, and achievement has risen over time. So the, the higher income, uh, since the 1970s, the achievement gap between children from families whose income is in the top 10% of the income distribution, their scores are going up and up and up much faster than the scores of those who come from families in the bottom 10% of the distribution. So there's more inequality across those deciles. Now we also know there's more income inequality. So the top 10% now earns much more than they used to as a fraction of all the income in the population. So why? Well, there are lots of possible reasons, but I'm going to look at two possible reasons. One is trends in monetary resources, and the other is trends in time inputs. So this is from Duncan and Murnane, where they document that the gap in just expenditures on home enrichment has grown over time. So this is from 1972 to 73, up through the mid-2000s, and this line here is the top income quintile, meaning the top 20% of income. On average, how much do they spend on educational resources for their children? Just enrichment expenditures. This is not even private tuition. And you can see over time, and this is adjusted for inflation, that has risen, whereas it's been relatively flat for families that are in the bottom 20% of the quintile. All right, so we definitely see a difference in sort of the monetary resources, just in enrichment expenditures. And this is from a particularly uh, interesting book called Wither Opportunity. This is just chapter one. There are other ones talking about how wealthier families are more likely to pay private tuition and that you've actually had a decline in uh, family, families sending their kids to private school from the more modest income. If you think back to, say, the first half of the 20th century, many more even modest income people would send their kids to say Catholic schools, which were private schools where they, they could get a pretty good education and you're seeing a lot less of that now. Question. Is yes. The, of the discretionary income, yeah. is more of it going to education than it is their cars and their homes, or is, oh, that, is, is it all the same? It's, uh, you, there's more going to everything because the people in the top 20% are just, their, their income is really growing significantly. So they're spending on all kinds of things. The other thing is the gap in parental time has risen, okay? So in 2010, my husband, Gary Ramey, who's also a professor of economics at UCSD, and I published an article in the Brookings Institution of Brookings Papers on Economic Activity, which we call the Rug Rat Race, which documented some key trends on time spent on childcare. And I have to say, it was semi-autobiographical, okay? We, we had, when we were first hired here in 1987, we lived down in Claremont, because that's where we could afford to live. And then after 10 years there in 19, wait, when did we, did we uh, yeah, 1998, we moved up to University City. And I assumed that other mothers would be, you know, have careers too, and it, it, you know, you would see a lot more of that. And I was just astounded to see how these highly educated mothers who'd had careers 
So many of them had given up their careers so that they could drive their kids to soccer. And I said, well, you know, what's going on here? So it turns out there were two things going on. One is moving from the lower income neighborhood to the higher income neighborhood. But then the other thing was a time shift, as you'll see, because we were in the uh, old neighborhood you know, in the early 90s up to 98, and then we shifted to this new neighborhood. Now, how am I going to figure this out? Well, I'm going to show you information from time diaries of thousands of people. Okay? So time diaries were collected initially in the US just by university <coughs> researchers, you know, on average once a decade, because that's the only time they could get their funding. But then the US Bureau of Labor Statistics started collecting them regularly in 2003. I remember if I told you. Yes, so let me tell you how it works. So, so if you get called uh, for, for a time diary research, what they'll do is they kind of tell you ahead of time and then they're gonna ask you, what time did you wake up? And then you're gonna say that, and then what did you do the next 15 minutes? Da 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 da, the previous day. And it turns out that's much more accurate than if you ask somebody, on average, how much time do you spend studying or whatever, because people tend to inflate that. Um, so so they're, they're quite accurate, and, and actually some of these were done even back uh, to the early part of the 20th century, but, but the ones I'm going to use are, are from 1965. Okay, so we gathered those data, and we calculated time spent on childcare, right? This is weekly child care by mothers, and I'm looking right now at the age group 25 to 34. We also have the other age groups in there, but I'm just going to show you one so you don't see too many graphs. Um, 65, 75, 85, and an early 90s, those were those decadal ones. And then there were a few in 98, 2000, and then we got them every year from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And we were astounded to see, although given what we had experienced, perhaps not so astounded to see, you see a gentle decline in hours spent per week. Let's talk about college-educated parents. And then it just shoots up to this higher level. It's come down slightly, but not very much. And you see that for the college-educated. If you look at parent, uh, mother who has less than college, so this could be somebody from a junior college or high, just high school grad or even a high school dropout. That's the red line here. They also increase, but not quite as much. And if you look at the numbers, the increase for college-educated mothers was between eight to 10 hours per week, eight to 10 hours per week during this time. For less educated mothers, it was uh, five to six hours per week. Okay, so there was some, something happened here. And uh, it didn't happen in Canada. So we actually got time use data from Canada and we didn't see it happening there. We, we really saw it happening here. We spent a lot of time making sure that we were being consistent across these studies. And in fact, we took other studies where children reported how much time they spent with their parents. And that also showed this big jump. Now, for fathers, now notice that the scale on this is a little bit less. On average, fathers spend less time, but we're still seeing this dramatic increase. Much more, you know, somewhat more so for college-educated fathers, but even the less than college-educated are also, is also increasing. So about one to five, five to six hours for college educated fathers, about four hours per week for less educated fathers. Right? So a tremendous increase in time spent on children by, by both groups, more so for the college educated. Can I ask a question? Yeah. What qualifies weekly child care hours? What qual so, yeah. so they're very specific about doing it. So this is going to be total. So this is anything from changing diapers to, uh, uh, and I'm going to show you some categories, uh, chauffeuring, breastfeeding, you know, anything that's child care. Even uh, if you show up for a PTA, what will PTA, not quite. If you meet with the child's uh, teacher, that's child care. Okay, and, and, and we can break it down, you know, in various uh, categories. I'm just kind of showing you the thing. And we had only done this up through the early 2000s, and actually this last weekend I downloaded all the latest data and updated it just to see if it had changed and it had not. So the rise is a big puzzle because fertility fell since the 1960s, and the majority of mothers now work, right? And so and the other thing is that the more educated people's wages have gone up, and so the cost to you of 
those hours spent taking care of your children has gone up, right? Because you, you're, you're so much more productive in the market. So here's just a graph. Uh, this was just actually just straight out of our paper. So the birth rate, you know, we know about the baby boom, and then it came down and it troughed here, and the birth rate stayed down. But yet if you take all women ages 18 to 54, not just mothers, so you're, you're looking at the average over all women, you're seeing this dramatic increase in time spent on child care. So in our paper, we went through a variety of possible explanations. You know, was it crime rates? Well, it turns out that the crime rates peaked in the early 90s, right when child care was low, and was going down when child care time started increasing. What we argue is that a, you know, a key part is the demand for admissions to good colleges rose much faster than the number of slots. And I'll show you a graph on the next slide. So, our idea is the following, right? Before you had this, it's called cohort crowding. Before you had that, most college-educated parents said, well, I can get my kid into a pretty good school, all right? It might not be Harvard, but, you know, I can get them into one of the good University of Californias, and, you know, I'll be fine. The problem is that the demand for college went up much more than the supply of slots at colleges. So Harvard and Yale and them have hardly increased their slots to you know, you know this, right? You have all the pressure from the parents. Um, have hardly increased their slots. Now, there's a college for everybody, people will tell you. But the quality of the college that's increasing its slots, on average, is much lower than the quality of the flagship, you know, public universities and the Ivies. So this created a situation in which college-educated parents who've previously been able to get their kids into good colleges started worrying and started increasing their efforts to repair their children and basically ramped it up to a new level, all right? And this was the rug rat race that we talk. It's a tournament that you're actually competing against the other parents for those scarce slots. And there, we talked in the paper about the numerous things the American Academy of Pediatricians talked about how kids you know, are so stressed out now in part because they're trying to pad their resumes. So here, this just shows you the number of college graduates in the U.S. in thousands. So when the baby boom got old enough to go to college, you had this big hump. And then you had a trough here. And my, one of my colleagues who's older than I am, he says, yeah, he was lucky. His kids applied to colleges during this. They both went to Yale. You know, it wasn't so stressful. Um, but then it went back up. But it's not just the number of college of high school graduates. It's that laid over the propensity of high school graduates to enrollment in college, and that's really gone up. Okay. And of course, now there's international competition uh, students from other uh, places. Now, part of the increase in demand for college is they're increasing returns to education. The average wage of somebody who's college educated, their income is much is growing relative to somebody who doesn't have a college degree. So uh, we look at a whole bunch of categories of things. Um, we looked at trends using some other things. But let me just show you. This is just pooling the Bureau of Labor Statistics time use survey. So this isn't telling you any change over time, but just saying after that big increase, how are parents spending their time on childcare? So we look at, say, mothers with children under five. Here's fathers with children under five. I put those on the same scale, all right? So for very young children, they spend a lot of time on physical care and supervising. And the red is less than college educated mothers and blue is the college educated mothers. Educating is a pretty small part in that age group. Playing is quite important, but it's a little bit of healthcare, organizing and attending activities, chauffeuring, all right? We get similar things. Fathers are always willing to put in a lot in playing, which is important, you know, but also physical care and supervising. Then when we look at mothers with children five and over, now notice that you're spending less time on children when they're older. I mean, it just takes so much more time to take care of babies, infants. But a big thing we found, and when we looked over time, was these last two categories. Okay, we see some on educating, all right? But it was these last two categories, organizing and attending activities and chauffeuring, all right? And when you look at it, it's all of those extra activities that kids are supposed to have on their resume. Right? So it's not just enough to help them with their homework and all those things. To get into the good colleges in the U.S., parents feel like they have to do these extra things. Now, I told you that in Canada, you, just, you didn't see 
this. You, you saw a slight increase, but, but nothing like here. In Canada, most people still go to the college in their province. What matters not so much is the college, but rather the major. And all they care about is your grades. They don't care about extracurriculars. So they didn't have to get into this rug rat race to, in order to get into the colleges because it just didn't count. Even if your kid was a great tennis player, it doesn't matter. What mattered was your grades. Okay. Uh, any questions? So this is just sort of a summary of, of you, you know, you can find it. If you want to read more, you can find it on my website. But when you hear the rug rat race, we're the ones that coined the coin. Is there anything in the data that surprised you? Or is this oh. Okay? Everything, well, we weren't quite, when we went into it, we were sort of kidding. Oh, it must be, like, you know, driving the kids to soccer. And then when we saw it, there, I mean, that kind of guided us to look. And we said, oh, my goodness, it really is there. Yeah. So, so that's, you know, I always like to be surprised by research. You know, you kind of go in with prior notions, but you don't want them to be too strong. They sort of guide you where to start looking, but then sometimes you're surprised. Um, we were surprised by the... The dramatic increase. You know, we thought it would be more. Uh, it would be smooth. Okay. So that's parental time on child care. Although we're going to visit, revisit that a little bit when I talk about other groups. So let me talk about another paper which yeah, I started writing in 2011, and then uh, one of our former grad students who now works has been working at Amazon for a number of years. We started working on it together. It's part of, an early version is part of his dissertation. We study time used by students. So here's another important input. Um, and I was initially inspired by the large fraction of UCSD students who are Asian Americans. And this is before we started having you know, non-resident students come in. I looked, and particularly in economics and science, just a huge fraction of names. You couldn't find a Smith or Jones on the list, but there were so many Chans and Chings and Wins and, and Woos. And I said, and I looked at the fraction of California that's Asian American, and, and you know they're a minority. And I said, "Wow, I wonder what's going on here." So I had started looking at this, and then the Tiger Mother book by Amy Chua was published in 2011. So that also intrigued me. So that's uh, you know, if you ever wonder how professors start start projects, that was how I started this one. So the motivating questions is, and I'll show you some statistics here. Why do Asian Americans, on average, have higher educational achievement than other groups? Their test scores are significantly higher even within schools, and I'll show you the details there. Many point to culture, but culture itself is not an input into the educational production function. So we do think that culture is really important, but the question is how do you turn culture into higher educational achievement? And that's what we're trying to look for here. What production inputs are affected by Asian culture? And we're going to argue that time use is key. And then what do the achievement gaps imply about ways to improve educational achievement in the US? I'm not going to have much time to talk about it, but I had to give a talk back uh, several years you know, with the idea, can we reproduce tiger mom effects for other groups? Okay. All right, so, so achievement gaps. So it turns out, because Asian Americans are a small fraction of the population, it's actually hard to find samples where there are enough of them in there so that you can actually get uh, more reliable statistics. However, a third of all Asian Americans live in California, so it probably has the largest sample of Asian students in any US educational data set. And as you know, California uh, administers statewide standardized tests every year. This happens to be the 2016. I didn't have time to update this whole paper. But it tests a total of 3.3 million students across grades 3 through 8 and grades 11. And of these, 300,000 were Asian Americans. That's a nice big sample. So what we do is we compare students in the same school, in the same grade, in the same subject, and the same broad advantage or disadvantage group. And the, the definition of disadvantage group is that you have free or subsidized lunch. So at least we have some idea there. Because we don't have the student level data, because California will never, it won't uh, release that like some other states like Texas has. Okay. So what I'm showing you here is our, the estimates from all of these data that we downloaded um, on test score gaps. All right. So one hears a lot about test score gaps of say white versus underrepresented minorities, say you know Hispanic or African American. 
But it turns out, I'm, you know, as I'm showing you here, there's another test score gap that's just as big, but going the other way. All right. So this is the gap relative to whites. So think of whites right here as uh, the red line. Okay. Obviously, they're learning more every year, but but we've sort of normalized it there. And here is by grade, third grade, fourth grade up, and then eleventh. And then this is the within school comparison. And here is for math. And here are for the students who are not economically disadvantaged, and here are for the ones who are economic, who come from economically disadvantaged uh, households. Okay. So, and then the little gray lines are this 90% uh, uh, confidence interval. So it means that we've estimated this really precisely because we have so much data. Okay. So you notice that starting at third grade, which is when the public schools first start testing, typically, the Asian kids are, um, and this is, I think, relative to standard deviation, but you don't need to know that. The point is, they are scoring higher, even starting in third grade. Whereas, and some, this has received a lot of attention to literature, the Hispanic children and the black children are scoring lower on average. But what's also interesting is the fanning out. So every extra year in school, the gap between Asians and white is increasing. And people know about this gap increasing, but People have not looked at that gap. Among the economically disadvantaged, again, the, it's fanning out and the, the differences are uh, at least as big there. And again, there's fanning out. There it's a little bit more stable. But huge gap relative to whites. Now that's math. The gap is a bit small. It's you know smaller for uh, English language arts. Part of it is a lot of these kids come from households where they don't speak English in the household. Um, but you still see a significant gap relative to whites, and it's it's a little bit more stable. It doesn't keep fanning out like the other one, right? So big test score gaps. The, the age, particularly with respect to math, this gap that everybody's focused on. Well, this gap is just as big. So, summary, there are significant differences in test scores across ethnic groups, even within the same school. The differences for Asians are even larger. What I've showed you is the subdivided groups, then when we pull them all together, and the differences become greater at higher grades. Well, this answered my initial thing. How come uh, uh, Asian Americans are so overrepresented in California schools? Well, we can see from the test scores, I mean, at, the, the, at, sorry, in the, at UCSD as we're talking about, and Berkeley. So why is Asian American achievement so high? It's not better schools, because I'm looking here, I'm comparing students within the same school. All right? So we suggest in this paper that a key explanation is the time use of students. So measuring student hours inputs, we go to the American Time Use Survey, which is the one done by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, to study how time use differs across groups. This is a nationally representative sample. It's based on time diaries. It's a subsample of the one where they produce the unemployment rate. It's known as the current population survey. Uh, it, covers it covers individuals 6, 15 and up. Now we have other stuff in uh, other results in the paper for younger ones. It's not as well measured, so I'm just going to focus here on uh, this survey. Uh, 15 and up, so at least we get some high school in there, okay? And we combine, I hadn't updated 2018, but we combined in all these years in order to get enough observations of uh, teenage Asian American kids in the sample. Okay, so some definitions of key activities. So one of the activities is class, taking classes for degree, certification, license, or test prep, okay? Homework, research or homework for class for degree, other research not related to a personal interest class, all right? So I'm going to be talking about homework a lot, and so that's important. We're also going to look at chores, household chores, care for family members, work, and then a few other uh, interesting categories, but those are sort of four main ones. So this was the real shocker that I think I had first produced a graph like this back in 2010. This is for full-time high school students, ages 15 to 18. This is the amount of time spent on homework per week on average, all right? Asian, black, Hispanic, white, 13.5 hours for Asian, 
black 3.2, Hispanic 5.3, white 5.9, all right? So not as, you know, you see some differences here, but they are just dwarfed by that difference. <coughs> Full-time college students, so these are the kids who actually make it to college. Even in college, you're still seeing a gap, right? So these are all the successful ones who've made to college, and the Asian students are still uh, spending much more time studying than the black, Hispanic, and white. Now some of this, because I know from other research, they're more likely to major in you know, pre-med, the sciences, and, and study time for those majors tends to be higher than for other majors, whereas you have much more dispersed uh, majors that are taken by the other groups. Okay. So this gap here, I think seven, I said it was 7.6, I guess, um, how, or 7.5 when I round. So the question is, how much of that 7.5 hour gap among the high school students between Asians and whites is explained by family background? Because okay? remember, I already told you, you know, there's differences in families. I'm now going to show you the differences across these groups after controlling for key characteristics of family backgrounds. Now this is also an interesting table because because I'm going to also report on how different characteristics of family backgrounds themselves have, have an effect. All right, so we had a 7.5 hour gap without controlling for anything other than the ethnic racial group. Here's after we've controlled. So the gap for Asians falls from 7.5 to 5.3, but it's still really significantly different. Okay, so there's still some that I'm not picking up with these other variables. But what are the other variables? And then the Hispanic gap actually disappears in terms of homework once you control for these other variables. What are these variables? Well, first of all, male students spend 1.4 hours less doing homework than female students, which is kind of interesting. If there's a father in the home, on average, kids are doing 2.8 hours more homework per week. If there's a mother in the home, which is two two hours more per week. If their mom has a college degree, but not a graduate degree, two more hours, and this is relative to, uh, this is relative to say somebody, uh, everybody else who doesn't have, a, whether mother might have junior college or just high school degree. If, in addition, if their father has a college degree, but no grad degree, 1.6 more hours. If their mother has a graduate degree, that's even bigger, 2.7 more hours. If their father has a graduate degree, 2.3 more hours. If they have a foreign parent, they study more. A foreign-born parent, right? And then if you look at the income categories, basically the high income, it's not as big, um, but you, you do get more from higher income. One thing researchers find, it's actually the parent's education level more than the income level that affects these sorts of inputs there. So it's kind of useful. So you can see, you know, if you're a kid who is, say, comes from an Asian household, and suppose both your parents are in the home and they both have grad degrees, you know, you're studying a lot more. But even there, this is, this is after controlling for all of these sorts of things. So we had to laugh when um, our daughter was in seventh grade. She brought home a report card you know, from Bishops, and it was pretty good, but you know, math was B plus. And I remember we had the same talk with her that my father had with me when I was in second grade and brought home a B plus in math. And, and we said, well, this is all very good, but we think you can do even better. So she went back to school the next day, and then um, she came home. She says, I told my friends what you said to me. You know what they called you? And I said, what they called us? She said, they called you Asian. And I said, okay, fine. <laughs> if that means that we care about your grades, then, then. <laughs> Now it's interesting, um, my, uh, so my son's wife, my daughter-in-law, is a Vietnamese American. She's the oldest of five children. Her parents were both boat people from Vietnam. And I would ask her, and she says, oh yes, we had to do little worksheets when we were kids. Um, and that's, that's just what they did. And then when I asked like my co-author Ling Xiao and other people, sometimes they have uh, schools on Saturday. So for example, some of my, um, one of my Japanese uh, 
co-authors who's lived in the U.S. for many years but grew up in Japan, he said that he sent, he and his wife sent their kids to the Japanese school. And these schools were set up here for, say, businessmen from Japan who wanted to make sure their kids kept up with the curriculum of the Japanese schools so that, you know, because they often intended to go back. But then many other people who are Japanese send their kids there too because they also learn a lot of culture. So part of this extra homework is the Saturday schools going on, I think. Um, so, the quite, so you can also ask, okay, if they're doing all this homework, what, you know, what aren't they doing? So this is, uh, let's see, yeah, so this is the extra, this might be slightly different, high school students, so we see much more among the Asian students for the homework. And, and the stars mean that it's statistically different from the whites. Class attendance, it's a little bit more for Asian, but they're not really that different. Paid work, this is an interesting thing. White kids are more likely to have to uh, spend and to spend time in paid work, you know, after school jobs and things, than, than all the other ethnic groups. So Asian kids have much fewer hours in paid work than any of the other groups, okay? Chores, once again, so the Hispanic kids and the white kids are the ones more likely to do chores. Asians do somewhat less. Sleep, this is pretty similar. The, the only uh, bigger, particularly bigger numbers, interesting, is the black kids spend more hours sleeping. Um, personal care, there's, a, there's some difference there. And then uh, we started looking at leisure. So this is leisure excluding sports, because I don't know if you read Amy Chua's book, she claimed that her kids weren't allowed to have sleepovers and all that kind of stuff. You know, my kids lived on the sleepovers. <laughs> so there is less socializing among the Asians, fewer hours spent socializing. Um, TV and computer, they're, it's about the same as whites, the black, uh, kids spend a few more hours on TV and computer. The Hispanic kids are more like the, the whites and Asian. Reading and writing, they're all sadly very low <laughs> for all of them as, as part of their leisure time. Um, sports, okay. So Asian kids are also less likely to spend time in sports uh, than, say, white kids. Extracurricular activities, on average, that's relatively low. This is other than sports. Volunteer. There's a little bit there, religious activities a little bit there. So the Asian kids are spending more time on homework, less time on paid work, a little bit less on chores, uh, less time socializing, and less time on sports. So that's where the time comes from. Uh -huh. uh, I'm just wondering if the TV computer category, if you could break that, or if anyone is trying to break that down a little bit into entertainment-based computing versus education or phone use. I've tried it. It's really hard to do. Um, yes, because when they say, did you use a computer to do bills, say, for an adult, then that would be in household chores. So they do some of that, but with kids, it's a little bit hard to tell. So if they use the computer for homework, it gets classified as homework. Okay, And if they're on Facebook or whatever, Facebook, I guess it's old hat for kids now, whatever it is that they're on, um, then you know that would be just the TV computer screen time kind of thing. So, you know, Amy Chua's book made you kind of wonder how could she be a law professor at Yale and spend hours sitting next to her daughter at the piano making sure that she was practicing. And so I said, do, do Asian American parents really have to spend that much more time on childcare? So we then looked at uh, what the parents' time use was. So this is total child care, this is all the possibilities. Basic child care, helping, organizing activities, teaching, talking, reading, playing, medical care, dealing with daycare providers, general travel related to child care. And then within that, we also look at educational child care. And we also control for whether the parents had a college degree and all those sorts of things. So we're, we're trying to take out family background and just look at the ethnic parts. So here are weekly hours spent on child care as a primary activity for mothers by group. And the total is given by the top of the chart. And um, the educational part is the dark part. So, so the light green is the non-educational, and the dark green is the educational part. So if you look at overall time, white and Asian 
mothers are spending about the same amount of time. Okay? The Asian mothers are spending 40 minutes more per week on educational activities than white mothers, which isn't that, right? So most of these, on average, these mothers are not sitting uh, on the piano stool next I'm to the- I'm still looking at the 15 year old. This one, no, this is uh, all mothers with any child under 18. So, uh, and, and we, I think we control for the age of the child kind of thing. So the way I see this, I say, you know, this is what it means to be a tiger mother, is that you can get your kids to do a lot, spend a lot more time on homework and not have to spend a lot of time yourself, <laughs> you know. Um, one thing is in, in the paper, we also look at secondary child care, which means your primary thing might be cooking, but then secondarily, you're you know, looking over and making sure they're doing homework. We didn't see big differences there. I thought I would, because sort of the picture I had was, uh, you know, just stereotype in the white family. The kid goes up to the bedroom and says, I'm doing homework. But of course, they're really on social media. But in the more strict families, uh, the kids are at the d dining room table next to whoever's cooking in the kitchen. And so then they can monitor them. But um, I didn't really see a lot of evidence uh, of that. Okay. And then for fathers, uh, it's a similar story. White and Asian fathers spend about the same total amount of time. The Asian fathers spend on average 20 minutes more per week on educational activities than white fathers. So, you don't see quite a, you know, not the big difference, I would say. But the other reason I really cared about this is there were, um, I was on the uh, acad Academic Dishonesty Hearing Board at UCSD, which is one of these unpleasant but important committees, and we'd have hearings. And there was a case of uh, an Indian American student, you know, and the question was it turned, because he had returned an exam and then it had something corrected. And then it, it came up on this, and his parents had come, his mother was in a sari, and it turns out that he was on the phone almost every night with his father, who was some big software engineer in San Jose. And I thought, wow, I said, you know, our kids don't get that, get that kind of service from us. But it, you know, when I saw all that extra time input, so I think that there, you do see pockets of a lot of extra time input by the parents, but we're not seeing it, you know, at least on average uh, from the time diaries. Okay, so should I continue with grandparents or how are we doing tiny lives? Yeah. Sure. Like okay. Um, <laughs> So this is research in progress. I, I did present it at a conference in Paris, but you know, I still haven't completely written it up. Uh, but I'll just show you some of the results. So I was interested in the extent to which grandparents could make up for lower time spent by less educated parents. Okay? And it'll become obvious when I show you a little bit more. So I'm going to show you time investments in grandchildren by older individuals. Now it turns out we had to, I had, actually this is a solo author, I had to use several different data sources because there aren't sort of perfect ones. But I'm gonna kind of, I always say that when you don't have perfect data sources, it's more like creating a mosaic. Each piece is a little bit broken, but you can kind of get a picture out of it. And so that's what I'm gonna show you here. So here's the fraction of individuals who are grandparents by race and ethnic group, all right? So, 2004 and 2014, this is based on a survey of income participation. So the red is white female, the a red solid red dotted is white male, uh, and then we have black female, black male, Asian female, Asian male, Hispanic female, Hispanic male. Something to take from this is that Asians and to some extent, white, uh, let's see, what are the whites? Whites, yes. A lower graph means that they, so everybody ends up pretty much close to the same point. It means that white and Asian uh, adults become grandparents later at, at older ages than uh, Hispanic and black, okay? And, and you know, if you look at fertility rates, they, you know, a lot of white Asians, in part because they're going to school, uh, have, have delayed their fertility. And so then that means you get grandchildren later. Okay, now here's also the fraction of individuals who are grandparents by education, all right? So here the red is dropout. So uh, high school dropouts. So high school dropouts become grandparents quite young on average. Uh, whereas the college, CL means college, college educated, 
uh, individuals become grandparents older, and you know even at lower rates. Okay, so there there are fewer grandparents by the time they uh, reach 75. So so it's important to keep that in the back of your mind because of the next uh, data that I'm going to show you. Oh, actually not the next several slides. Okay, one thing that's important is co-residence. What fraction of children actually live? with grandparents. So it turns out that 10% of all children co-reside with their grandparents in the U.S. 67% uh, of co-resident households were maintained by the grandparents. And uh, in 1970, approximately 3% of all children lived in grandparent-maintained households, whereas now it's 10%, so it's actually a higher percent. Uh, oh, as of 2012, 6% did, um, and these statistics are from the U.S. Census. Here's the percentage of children under 18 living with grandparents by race and Hispanic origin. So it turns out black, you have the highest percentage of children living with grandparents, but next is actually Asian. All right. And then Hispanic, all children, and then white. So whites are the least likely the children to live with grandparents. So I wanted to look at time spent by older individuals with their grandchildren. And this, again, is evidence from the American Time Use Survey from the BLS. Um, pooled data again. And I'm going to use two measures. One is just time with, which just means you're in the same room. You don't have to necessarily be caring for them, but you're in the same room with them, because that can matter. Uh, includes household and non-household grandchildren. Now, I don't know who is the parent, grandparent, I mean. So this is why it's important to keep in the back of the mind the fraction of people who are grandparents. I just use ages 40 and over. Um, and then time caring for, so that's primary child care. Actual measures child care while in the same room as a grandchild. Okay, so women ages 40 and over. This is time spent with grandchildren and time spent caring for grandchildren. Um, whites don't spend as much time caring for grandchildren. Now, part of it is, remember as I said, is they become grandparents later. So I've, I've just had to lump everybody together because I don't know who actually has grandchildren. Um, whereas Hispanic is the highest. Okay? And then time, you know, actually caring, again, Hispanic and black are higher than white. Asian is sort of in between white and Hispanic and black. And then this is, that should say men, think. Oh, no, no, sorry, this is by education. So people who are high school dropouts are much more likely to spend time with their grandchildren. Again, they become grandparents earlier, but they're probably, you know, helping out a lot. And college is the least. And then men, we're seeing similar things. Hispanic men spend more time with grandchildren than the other groups. And uh, again, dropout is the category of people who spend time with their grandchildren. Uh, so women spend more time with grandchildren than men. I didn't highlight that, but that's shouldn't be too surprising. And then, um, time spent in primary childcare is much less than time spent with grandchildren, just being in the room with them. Black and Hispanic women spend more time with grandchildren than white or Asian women. And time spent with and caring for grandchildren is decreasing in education levels. Thus, it's possible that grandparents are making up for some of that child care time gap across education levels. So it could be that you know, if you think about your, your uh, couple with graduate degrees, there's a good chance that they don't live in the same town with their parents. So our daughter and her husband-to-be are about to go off to Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, where he's got where she's gotten a postdoc and he's gotten a professor position, but you know, they're gonna be really far away. So it's gonna be a little hard for us to spend a lot of time with grandchildren. So to some extent to the extent that uh, less educated parents are more likely to live near their parents, then you're gonna get more extended family inputs, you know, that could they could make up for some of that gap that we see. All right. So just some conclusions, so I've kind of shown you a whole bunch of cuts of time use data and thinking about these inputs in the household. There are really significant differences across groups by education level and by ethnic group um, on uh, time invested in children and time spent by the children themselves on educational activities. And this important component into the educational production function might explain some of those educational achievement gaps that we see, because schools can only do so much. Um, but they may also suggest ways to reduce those gaps. And if one can just 
you know, try to, uh, uh, one thing I had suggested, because we had to come up with some small scale thing that could be scaled up, and it was the idea of setting up in rec centers, having college students volunteer, and offering uh, babysitting for uh, the children of less educated parents, but when they're there, they're on a tablet doing, with the college students, doing educational activities. And that, that was my idea for how to put a tiger mother in your uh, kitchen <laughs> kind of thing. All right, thanks, and I'm open for questions. Yes? Um, going back to the slide where you had, um, you were controlling the various factors. Yes. One of the factors was having a farm for one parent, two, two oh, extra hours. Yes. Study. Have you seen what happens when you go to the next generation? Yeah. yeah. So, so you don't, so you don't see that. that. That's why, because those children, if they were born in the U.S., then they show up, you know, as non-foreign-born parents, and you don't see that. No, it's, it, you really see that in. But, but in that the day, first. you're looking at. You have to identify which ones with U.S. parents had foreign-born. Had foreign-born. You can do that to some. So how? Well, um, I remember. I think that we'd actually, had we figured that out? Because in some of the studies, you would actually link up to the parents, and we're fat, you know, it just diminishes people, they assimilate, you know? <laughs> Despite the best efforts of their parents, you know? So just like my daughter-in-law, her father was kind of shocked. She, she married an American, you know, as, as the grandmother said, who's that American she's marrying? Because <laughs> you know, she's Vietnamese American. <laughs> Yeah. So, so there's a simulation, yeah. but but that that initial, uh, the initial people who immigrate, those parents really, you know, keep the, the culture of really striving, you know, to get ahead typically on average. Uh -huh. I was just wondering. So, to me, Asian is a wide, very wide That's category. Did you find a particular? country of origin or, or something where yep. this these market things were much higher or was it generally true across every country okay. so um, we had enough data from the California test scores to look and they, and they had really detailed data and yes the top one was China and then yeah, I, I had it long. They, they have all that detail. And then others were less so. But China was the one with the biggest achievement gap. The problem is in the national time use surveys, they're, you know, they interview people age 15 to I forget what. So, so the fraction who are just 15 to 18 and then the fraction of those who are Asian is just so small that we really couldn't break it up into the, the other categories. Plus, they don't even have as clear categories. But definitely on the test scores, the China, China was the highest. I remember that. Japan was not as high as I had thought it would be. I think you know, part of it, again, is most of the Japanese immigrants came a long time ago, and now they just assimilated to, you know, so, so that foreign-born parent effect you know, uh, isn't there. Is there different criteria for visas from different parts of the world? So, it's, it's, you know, coming from China, do they tend to be more intellectual capital coming over because that's the criteria to get a visa? How, how is that? Yeah, yeah, that can definitely have an effect. So, at least, it, you know, in the time we were able to control for those things in the time use data, in the achievement score data, all we could do was tell whether they had a. Uh, Free or subsidized lunch. So at least we were taking that out. But but in the group that wasn't economically disadvantaged, you know, they could have had graduate student, par you know, parents with graduate degrees, or you know, just high school degrees that weren't that didn't have low income. So we couldn't pick uh, uh, pull those apart as much as we would have liked. Yeah, yeah and Indian. So, so I remember what were the numbers? I should have looked. I, have the paper on my website, so I could look. Um, to, no, actually, it's not on my website; it's on my Dropbox. But I, I could, because I have all those details there. I can look at that. I'm curious about how all of this, and I don't know if you have the answer, or maybe you can point me to towards another study that will show how does this data translate into success later on after college? And how many executives are there their age? I mean, how, what is the breakdown by? Um, yeah. So if you look, so, so certainly um, in terms of educational achievement, the educational achievement of the Asian Americans is much higher than the white. And if you look at median family income, it is higher than white. 
So, so it's all it's showing up in all of those numbers. Um, you know, if you look at, you know, it depends on. I think that I mean, certainly you see more and more medical professionals who are Asian American. So they're showing up. My, my um, daughter-in-law is a dentist. So she met my son at Stanford when they were freshmen. Um, they now live in Seattle. He's an engineer for Boeing, and she has her own dental practice. And, you know, just she, because her father told her. You're going to be a dentist, so she's okay, <laughs> and she's enjoying it. So, <laughs> um, so, so you definitely see that the higher income, higher educational levels. So, so on all of the measure, those measurable ones. Now, my husband always said, he says, yeah, but are they happier? They worked so hard, you know. So, so there's a question there. Um, I, th I think it's really tough when they're working hard, but once they've achieved success, I think the happiness is actually pretty high. And then there's there's, and also the family ties, you know, that's a big, that's why our son lives in Seattle in part because her family's from Portland, she didn't want to be too far from the extended family, and I think that that, that also helps too. <coughs> I was going to say, I have a, a student who um, a couple of years ago told me that his parents had read the Tiger Mother book and had used it as kind of a road map. <laughs> and so I, I expected that he might say, you know, think of that negatively as it had been so much pressure, but he thought it was great and he ended up going to Yale. So I guess, you know, I think if you're raised in that, it's not necessarily that you think of it as too much pressure or yeah. a bad thing. I mean, some of it, you know, I certainly see some of the students at UCSD whose parents pushed and pushed them, and then they just decided to take a break. I was like, I'll do it. You know, and I felt bad. I remember way back when I first started teaching there, and, and um, a lot of their parents, you know, had been boat people and stuff, and then they were just screwing up, and then they felt bad. Oh, can't you please give me a better grade? He says, my mother would sew every night to make enough money to send me. I just Terrible. I said, well, how could you? I said, I can't give you a better grade than somebody else, but how could you do this to your mother? You know, <laughs> kind of thing. So, um, you know, yeah. I mean, I think there's two. This is just free associate. So, so we, the the uh, the work ethic and the culture and the appreciation of education is just a wonderful thing, and particularly when it's combined with the American educational system. Because we, you know, we had a big increase in non-resident students at UCSD, you know, because the, the, the story is that the state just really reduced funding, and we would have either had to kind of dismantle this wonderful institution of the University of California that had been built up in the 20th century, or try to find a way to get other sources of income. So we, ch we uh, charged the non-resident students almost as much as they paid to go to Princeton, then they go into our big classes. We do a good job, but still, it's not as cushy as Princeton and Harvard. And um, and so I've had a lot of interaction with those students. So on average, you know, there's always a distribution, you know, the hard workers and the goof offs and stuff. But on average, they work really, really hard. They will do. They're always asking for more homework problems and those sorts of things. But then they don't pay as much attention to the notes. I always say, pay attention to the principles because I. Because one of the ideas of the homework problems is to make sure you understand the principle. But then if I gave a problem that was kind of different where they had to think on their own, they would have more trouble than the kids who came out of the American schools. And then, of course, writing was really, really hard because they had come from an educational system where almost everything is multiple choice and there's more rote. They work very, very hard, very good at the math, but sort of kind of pushing them out of the, the safety of problems that are similar the Americans, they kind of go, oh, okay, you know, let me try this, just because that was, you know, Amer Asian Americans or any kind of Americans, because our educational system encourages that, whereas their educational system doesn't. So I saw some real advantages of their educational system. The mental math is amazing. I've always been terrible at mental math. And it was just like, they're getting those numbers just off the top of their head immediately. And, and then now uh, we have fewer in the econ major for, for reasons that I won't go into, but but now when I say, okay, how many can you calculate? Everybody's kind of sitting there like yeah. the typical American, like it is. I don't know. Let me look on my calculator. You know, we don't do the mental math as well. But anyway, so there are real advantages to their educational system. I think the best thing is taking the the appreciation of education and work ethic from Asia, but but having the kids raised in the American educational system. Uh huh. I have a question about how we're to compare your compelling research 
on the importance of homework and the thoughts now that we're hearing about not enforcing homework well, for younger students. So, so I've given you correlations, and this is one reason why I haven't finished this paper. So, so does, does more homework lead to higher achievement? We have some pretty good studies at the college level. We have, people have found this at the high school level, but, but the results are not um, as, the, ca the causal chain isn't as well as established as they've been able to do at the college level. It's not clear that there's this idea in economics called diminishing returns, which is that first hour you put into homework has really big returns, but then every extra hour has diminishing. I'm not sure that the Asian American kids aren't overdoing the homework. Okay, I'm not suggesting that people need to have 15 hours of homework a day, but probably maybe a little bit more than some of the other kids are doing. Um, you know, it depends. It's much more research needs to be done to figure out, you know, what's the optimal amount of homework because I think there can be too much homework, but I think there can also be not enough homework. So there's kind of a happy medium. I know my kids, they. They had to work so much harder in high school than I did. I mean, I worked pretty hard in high school, but they worked really hard. This is at Bishop's School, and I'm sure they work really hard here. And I just, you know, and that's where the difference, where, you know, a lot of, some of the under-resourced public high schools, I think that they can get pretty good grades without having to work so hard. So there's a real inequality in how much time people are spending to get that grade in high school. Thank you. I have one more question. Oh, sure. uh, you have a lot of data on quantity, but what about quality? No, that's, I, we would love to have that. And so, so I always think, say, this is where you want, say, the sociologist doing the ethnographic studies. So, so there's a wonderful book by Annette Leroux called um, Unequal Childhoods, where she sent all these researchers into households of upper socioeconomic status and, and lower and about how, how their kids spent their time. And in the lower one, the kids went out in the neighborhood and played with the neighbors. They saw their relatives a lot more. They played with their cousins. Whereas the upper income household, they had schedules on the refrigerator. Okay, <laughs> soccer game today, da 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 you know, and it was, she had a term for it, I forget. But anyway, it's a wonderful book, and that was another thing that inspired us when we were writing The Red Rat Race. Yeah, I'm also thinking about the quality time that parents might spend with the kids. Sometimes you go on the playground now, the kid is playing, you see, and for example, the parents on the... Uh, on no, that's something I like, because all the, all the parents with their phones, you know, walking along the soccer kind of thing, yeah. No, I, I would like to... So they spend the time, you have the quantity, but... Exactly, is exactly. It quality? But this is where you can look at, you know, reading to your child, some of those activities really, you know, uh, need you to put the time in. You know, we could break it down somewhat. I mean, some people say they have the best time with their kids in the car. I hate driving through traffic, because my daughter, of course, had to do horseback riding, so it was up to the Del Mar Forest Park and back, and we had spent time in the car, it was okay, but it, I didn't consider it the highest quality time. <laughs> okay. Thank you so right. much for being here.